Step 1. Ask for what you want, not for what you don't want. Every day you send out requests to the universe, as well as to your subconscious mind, in the form of thoughts. Literally, what you think about, read about, talk about, and give your attention to. This includes the books and magazines you read, the television shows and movies you watch, the emails you answer, the websites you visit, the blogs you read, and the music you listen to. Unfortunately, much of this thought is random, contradictory, non-productive, and certainly not deliberate. It happens without our conscious awareness or intention. Even worse, we send negative requests to the universe when we criticize ourselves, complain about things, and focus on the lack of abundance in our lives. Similarly, when you blame, find fault, or judge someone or something, you're also focusing on a negative experience that you don't want. The same is true when you worry. I often refer to worrying as negative goal-setting. You're creating pictures in your mind of what you don't want. Because the law of attraction states that you'll attract into your life whatever you give your energy, focus, and attention to, wanted or unwanted, you must become more deliberate about what you think and feel. The law of attraction also states that each thought or feeling you offer carries with it a vibrational frequency, to which the universe responds by giving you more of whatever you are vibrating. It doesn't care whether that request is good for you or not. It simply responds to your vibration. The problem is that, most of the time, you're not aware of the vibration you are offering. You are simply responding to things outside of yourself. Current events, the news, how people treat you, the stock market, how much money you make, how your children are doing in school, and whether or not your team wins. You're responding by feeling positive or negative. Unfortunately, when you merely respond unconsciously to what is currently happening around you, never offering deliberate thought about what you want in your future, you can stay stuck in your current condition forever. This is why most people's lives never seem to change. They get stuck in a cycle of recreating the same reality over and over, because the universe faithfully responds to the negative vibration they are sending out. Compare that with offering positive thoughts instead. Feeling excited, enthusiastic, passionate, happy, joyful, loving, appreciative, abundant, prosperous, relaxed, and peaceful. These are thoughts that give off positive vibrations. By contrast, feeling bored, anxious, worried, confused, sad, lonely, hurt, angry, resentful, guilty, disappointed, frustrated, overwhelmed, stressed out, or depressed gives off negative vibrations. The law of attraction responds either way and brings you more of what you are vibrating. This is shocking to most people. To learn that the life they're living now is the result of the thoughts and vibrations they've offered in the past is revolutionary. Even more exciting is learning that to create the future of your dreams, you need only change your thoughts and vibrations from this day forward. How would you be feeling if you already had those things and lifestyle experiences you desire? The perfect job, the perfect relationship, world travel, the amount of money that you want to have. Start intentionally creating your future. To become more intentional about the thoughts you offer the universe, you'll need to decide what you want, but also practice feeling those emotions you'll experience when you have it. To help you decide what you want, see Principle 3, Decide What You Want. To learn how to practice the emotional joy and satisfaction of having, being, and doing what you want, see Principle 12, Act As If. Perhaps you want to change careers, move to another state, win a major professional award, have your own TV show, or recover from a major illness. How would you feel once you've arrived at your goal? What would you be doing throughout your day? Who would you be spending time with? The more you focus on and talk about what you do want instead of what you don't want, the faster you will manifest your dreams and goals. Think of your mind as a GPS system, like the one on your smartphone or in your car. With every picture you visualize, you're inputting the destination you want to get to. Every time you express a preference for something, you are expressing an intention. A table by the window, front row seats at a conference, 
first-class tickets, a room with an ocean view, a loving relationship. These images and thoughts are all sending requests to the universe. Use words that focus the universe on what you want. Of course, how you state your goals is very important to this focusing process. Instead of saying, I want to get out of debt, which keeps your mind focused on the debt you have now, say, I am living a life of abundance and wealth. Words like these keep you in a positive state of thought. Be similarly careful when you talk with other people about your current situation. Talking about the way things are and describing what's going on in your current reality actually creates more of the same in your future. By thinking about and voicing opinions about your current situation, you're actually prescribing the future rather than simply describing the present. The difference between the two was dramatically brought home to me a few years ago when Mark Victor Hansen and I flew to New York to be inducted into the Ardith Rodale Hall of Fame in recognition for the positive impact of our Chicken Soup for the Soul books. On the flight to New York, I sat next to a man who spent the entire trip talking about how terrible the world was, the government, the economy, crime, corruption, pollution, how ungrateful and out of control teenagers were, and on and on. He was an unhappy man. But when Mark and I went out for a late dinner after the award ceremony, all we could talk about were all the wonderful things that were happening in our lives, our recent successes, the projects we were working on, how we could help each other, who we wanted to introduce each other to, the recent insights we were having, what we were grateful for, and all the other positives in our life. Having a positive outlook, using future-thinking language, and being in a state of expectancy about the good that's coming into your life is the best way to ask the universe to deliver the very things, people, and experiences you want. Replace negative images and thoughts with positive ones. In the same way that you can write the script for your exciting future life, you can prevent the things you don't want by keeping your mind off of them. Whenever you see things you don't want, Make a conscious decision not to think about them, write about them, talk about them, push against them, or join groups that focus on them. Whenever you catch yourself worrying or focusing on lack, quickly replace those negative thoughts with pictures, feelings, and emotions of you enjoying what you do want. This is intentional daydreaming, a great use of the power of visualization, something I discuss later in Principle 11. Whenever you slip into judging yourself, or someone, or something else, realize that you're focusing on what you don't want. Take action to shift your thinking. Civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King's greatest speech was not titled, I Have a Complaint. It was called, I Have a Dream. And when Mother Teresa was asked why she didn't participate in anti-war demonstrations, she said, I will never do that. But as soon as you have a pro-peace rally... I'll be there. These great leaders knew that to be against something, to focus on your opposition to it, just creates more of it. This is why meditation, mindfulness, and paying attention are so important. You will become more powerful in creating what you do want when you learn to focus your attention and monitor your thoughts. Replace negative thoughts that produce feelings of resignation, hopelessness, depression, guilt, fear and anger with more positive thoughts that produce feelings of happiness, contentment, love, acceptance, hope, peace, and joy. Ask for what you want. Then let the universe worry about how you'll get it. As I mentioned in Principle 3, decide what you want. Your only job is to focus on what you want. Don't worry about how to get it. That's the universe's job, and, as we'll see, it's phenomenally good at aligning the people, situations, money, resources, and other things necessary to bring about your desired goals. Be more intentional by deciding exactly what you want. Focus your thoughts. They will attract to you the people, things, and experiences that match the content and vibration of your thoughts. Just like the GPS system I mentioned earlier, when you present your goals to the universe and its powerful technology, you will be surprised and dazzled by what it delivers. 
This is where the magic and miracles truly happen. It's the same for Christians and other people of faith who are willing to turn their dreams, fears, and desires over to God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Step 2. Believe that you'll get what you want. Then take action. Our intentions attract the elements and forces, the events, the situation, the circumstances, and the relationships necessary to fulfill the intended outcome. We don't need to become involved in the details. In fact, trying too hard may backfire. Let the non-local intelligence synchronize the actions of the universe to fulfill your intentions for you. Deepak Chopra Physician, speaker, and author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success What does it mean to believe you'll get what you want? It means maintaining a positive expectancy, going about your day with certainty, knowing that you've put your future in the hands of powers that are greater than yours. It's deciding with conviction that what you want will absolutely happen. This is not always easy. Many people have limiting beliefs which keep them from allowing abundance and happiness into their lives. If this describes you, realize that you must first change your limiting beliefs into thoughts that you are deserving, worthy, lovable, desirable, and capable, as well as smart enough, strong enough, attractive enough, rich enough, good enough, and enough in every other way that matters to you. I've written a simple strategy in Principle 33. Transcend your limiting beliefs to help you eliminate any beliefs that are holding you back. And if you need to turn your inner critic into an inner coach, see Principle 32 for ways to overcome negative thoughts that can block the positive expectancy that is so critical to the law of attraction at work. Of course, once you believe that you'll get what you want, the second part of the equation is to take action. Taking the actions that would create your desired result affirms your belief that what you want is within reach. It adds to your expectation. Some of the actions you'll take are what I call obvious actions, like enrolling in biochemistry and anatomy classes in college if your goal is to become a doctor, or changing your diet if your goal is to lose weight. You don't need to wait for the universe to deliver a unique set of circumstances to you. It's obvious what you must do, and those opportunities are readily available to you. Then there are what I call inspired actions. These are actions you take when you receive inner guidance, an intuitive hit, a hunch, or a gut feeling. Like when you respond to a random thought such as, I don't know why, but I have this urge to call my college roommate, or... I'm feeling the strong need to attend that conference. Many people during their visualization or meditation time keep paper and pencil nearby to capture these ideas. Most of the time you won't see the whole plan, but with a strong enough belief, you can move forward and take action anyway, watching for other action steps to appear. She followed her inspiration. By thought, the thing you want is brought to you. By action, you receive it. Wallace T. Wattles, author of The Science of Getting Rich When Jeanette Ma was four months into her new job as a 401k sales rep for a large national bank, management announced that if the sales team didn't turn things around soon and create some impressive numbers fast, all of them would be out of jobs. Up until that time, they had followed very prescribed steps for making a sale make a certain number of cold calls each day, set up a certain number of meetings each week, and use a list of responses to potential objections. These were sales strategies that had been tried and proven many times for others, but it wasn't working for their team. And now the team was spending too much of its time discussing what was going wrong, whose fault it was, and why things weren't working. After learning their jobs were on the line if they didn't produce results in a hurry, Jeanette threw out her pipeline and script sheet and decided to try something else. She remembered hearing about a journal writing technique in which, if you wrote a page a day about what you wanted, as if you already had it, by the time you got to the end of your book, you would have what you want. 
Jeanette didn't have a lot of time, so she pulled out the smallest book she could find, a two-inch by three-inch notebook about twenty-five pages long. It took all of two minutes to fill her first page. She wrote about how excited prospects were to talk with her, how they loved her product and couldn't wait for her to implement it. She wrote about the instant excellent rapport she felt and how the product she offered really was the perfect solution for their company. After making her first entry, she checked in with herself about what felt good to do next. The answer was lunch. She hadn't had a real lunch since her first week on the job. Her lunch hour since then had consisted of literally running down the hall to the vending machine. Then she would run back to her desk and eat her unhealthy fare between calls to business owners. On this day, however, she followed her inner guidance and decided on a better lunch. It felt truly luxurious to actually leave the building, sit in an outside table, and enjoy her favorite Greek food on a spring day. After she enjoyed a delicious meal, she kicked her feet up on the table and threw leftover pita bread to the sparrows nearby. When she was good and ready, she meandered back to the office. It was in the elevator, on the way back to her cubicle, that a stranger introduced himself to her and asked who she was. I'm Jeanette, and I sell small business 401ks for the bank. He couldn't believe his ears. He insisted she follow him to his office, which is where he showed her a desk littered with 401k sales literature from a variety of vendors. He said he hadn't been able to make heads or tails of any of it, and he had no idea her bank sold 401ks to small businesses. She shared her sales material. He was elated. It was exactly what he wanted. He asked how soon she could put this in place for his company. In a bit of a daze, she let him introduce her to his human resources director. He instructed his human resources director to sign whatever Jeanette needed as soon as possible. He wanted this plan in place immediately. Within two hours of her first entry in her journal, she was already experiencing amazing success. Her colleagues and manager were equally astounded. This never happened. Jeanette attributed the happy result to giving up the supposed-to actions that management had given them, and instead doing what felt good. Know when to take inspired action. As the laws of attraction goes to work on your goals, you'll find that numerous ideas, strategies, and inspirations will come into your awareness. These might be flashes of insight that come up during visualization or meditation time. Sometimes the opportunity will appear in the form of an unexpected phone call or a new acquaintance who brings you details of a lucky break. At other times, it will be an unusual monetary transaction, rebate, or other financial boost that brings you the money you need to take the first step toward your goal. Yet again, it might be merely an impulse, an inspired idea, or a strategy that briefly comes to mind that you write down. I call these inspired ideas. They're not random ideas you'd like to try or strategies you think might work. They're approaches you've never considered before that could only have come to mind because of your use of the law of attraction. Whatever appears, your task is to recognize these opportunities for what they are, then act quickly while the associated energy is in your favor. It's not enough to simply think positive thoughts. When a chance appears, you must take action. When Janet Switzer wanted to sell her own book, Instant Income, shortly after the Success Principles was first released, she set the intention to land a publishing deal from a prominent New York publisher, then spent days writing an elaborate book proposal, knowing with certainty that an opportunity to take action would appear. Within two weeks, Janet got a call from the former chairman and CEO of Time Warner Book Group, who had recently retired and started his own literary agency. A friend had mentioned Janet's latest project to him, and he had called to discuss representing her. Because Janet was prepared with her book proposal, was clear about what she wanted, and recognized the lucky break for what it was, she took action and quickly signed on as one of the CEO's first clients. Within weeks, Janet was in New York meeting with America's biggest publishing houses and sold her book for a major advance just a few days later. In the beginning, as you start intentionally creating your future, 
It may seem like these inspirations and opportunities are swift to appear and overwhelming in number. You may not trust them all, and you'll probably feel like they're seriously impacting your to-do list. So how can you distinguish the truly inspired ideas, prioritize them, then accomplish all of them if you're supposed to take immediate action? How can you discern which actions are the most important and which can be left until later? One way is to use an exercise called somatic decision-making, sometimes referred to as the sway test. It's based on the idea that our bodies instinctively know what's right for us and can therefore help us decide by considering our different options. To start the process, stand with your feet together and your arms relaxed at your side. Close your eyes and simply ask your body, What is a yes answer? Wait until your body automatically leans forward or backward. Then ask your body, What is a no answer? If it leans in the opposite direction, you have successfully calibrated your body's answers. When you've determined which direction means yes for you and which way means no, you can begin to test the accuracy of the calibration by asking your body some standard questions that you already know the answer to, such as, Is my name Jack? Do I live in Dallas, Texas? Am I wearing a blue shirt? Once you have determined that you can trust the answers you are getting, you can begin to ask your body questions about the inspired ideas you've received. Should I bring on Jonathan as a partner in the business? Should I marry Doug? Should I buy the boat that Marcus called about today? Another way to discern between the many inspired ideas you receive is to simply see which ones keep coming up for you. When I first got the idea to form the Transformational Leadership Council, I didn't take action right away. In fact, it was months before I could take the necessary steps. But the idea kept popping into my head at odd moments, newly embellished with specific ideas about who to invite as members, what the organization's goals should be, where we would meet for annual meetings, and so on. I couldn't get those thoughts out of my head. The same thing happened with the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book. I got so many messages that I knew I simply had to take action on the idea. Step 3. Receive what you want by becoming a vibrational match for it. Remember I said that everything on Earth vibrates at a specific frequency? In order to receive that which you are intending, you must become a vibrational match for what you want to attract into your life. You are like a radio station that is broadcasting on a specific frequency. If you want to listen to jazz, you have to tune your dial to a station that broadcasts jazz, not one that plays heavy metal. If you want more abundance and prosperity in your life, you have to tune the frequency of your thoughts and feelings to ones of abundance and prosperity. The easiest way to become a vibrational match is to focus on creating positive emotions of love, joy, appreciation, and gratitude throughout your day. You can also practice feeling the emotions you would be experiencing if you already had what you wanted. You can also create these emotions through the thoughts that you think. In fact, your thoughts are creating feelings all the time, so it's important to catch yourself when your emotions turn negative, striving to replace them with what the Law of Attraction authors Esther and Jerry Hicks call a better-feeling thought. For example, thinking you don't have enough money to pay your mortgage will create negative feelings of fear and hopelessness even guilt and shame for not being able to provide for your family. Instead of giving energy to these negative thoughts, shift your thinking to positive ones such as, I will find a way, or by visualizing yourself easily paying the mortgage on time. At first, this process may seem foreign to you, but the truth is you can, over time, learn to choose only uplifting, inspiring, motivational, and empowering thoughts. It is simply a habit that, with intention and discipline, can be developed. Use affirmations to create a vibrational match. Another way to bring yourself into vibrational alignment with what you want is to use affirmations, something I discuss in great detail in Principle 10, Release the Breaks. An affirmation is a statement of your goal or desire, now realized in present time. They are statements you can write down, then repeat regularly, 
to bombard your subconscious mind with the thoughts, images, and feelings you would be experiencing if your goal was already complete. Affirmations sound like this. I am so happy and grateful that I live in a 4,000-square-foot oceanfront home on Ka'anapali Beach. Or, I'm so happy and grateful that I am effortlessly depositing $10,000 a month into my bank account. When you use affirmations to visualize your goals as already complete, you keep yourself in that heightened state of joy that is required to maintain a vibrational match to what you want. Resentment that you don't have what you want, on the other hand, keeps you out of vibrational alignment. It's simply impossible to receive or allow what you want when you are bitter, blaming, judging, or feeling guilty. These feelings push away what you want. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it would be enough. Meister Eckhart, German theologian and philosopher. Create a vibrational match through appreciation and gratitude. The two most powerful feelings for quickly manifesting your goals are appreciation and gratitude. Think about it. If you had whatever it is you are wanting, you would feel appreciation and gratitude for having received it. So not only is appreciation a great feeling to focus on, but gratitude is also a powerful mindset for attracting more of what you want. You can get into the habit of appreciation by making it a daily discipline. Set aside five to ten minutes a day to focus on appreciation. Make a list in your journal of all the things you are grateful for. That's how I first started. You can also practice appreciation and gratitude through meditation. Yet another technique is an exercise that Esther and Jerry Hicks call the Rampage of Appreciation where you simply look around you and gently notice something that pleases you. Hold your attention on it while you think about how wonderful, beautiful, or useful it is. If it's an item you own, appreciate the fact that it is already in your life. Continue observing it until you feel the appreciation expanding. When you do this, you are telling the universe, Give me more of this, please. Eventually, choose another object to appreciate, then another, and another. In my longer workshops, I will send people out of the training room on a silent rampage of appreciation, with instructions to focus on all the things in the environment that are serving them. I tell them to feel the appreciation not just for the carpet, which makes the room more attractive, makes the sound more pleasing, and makes walking on the floor more comfortable, but also to appreciate the hotel staff who vacuumed the carpet, the people who made the carpet, the people who installed the carpet, the people who made the dyes, the sheep that gave up their wool, the sheep farmers who sheared the sheep, and so on. People always return from this exercise with a smile on their face and joy in their heart, feeling much happier than when they left the room. You might want to take a short break now from reading this book and do a rampage of appreciation wherever you are. Notice how it makes you feel. The key here is to develop a practice of appreciation and begin to continually look for things to appreciate in your life. This goes for appreciating the positive aspects of all the people you meet, too. As you learn to focus on what is good about them, rather than what is wrong with them, you'll be amazed at how your relationship with them will change. Appreciating and being in a state of gratitude gives power to the old saying, What you think about and thank about is what you will bring about. When I was on the Oprah Winfrey show with several other teachers who appeared in the movie The Secret, there was a couple in the front row of the studio audience who had shared that before watching The Secret, they had not been happy in their relationship for a very long time. The woman said that after watching the movie, she decided to focus on the positive aspects of her husband rather than on all his thoughts and the things about him that irritated her. She also started writing him notes about what she appreciated about him and leaving them on the kitchen counter where he would find them in the morning. Some days she would even attach a ten-dollar bill with a note that said, I love you. This is for your first cup of coffee at Starbucks to get your day off to a good start. She said that over the course of just a few weeks, the love and romance had come back into their relationship. You could tell it was true by the way they were holding hands as they were sitting snuggled next to each other and smiling like a couple of high school sweethearts. Attention to what is only creates more of what is. 
In order to effect true positive change in your experience, you must disregard how things are, as well as how others are seeing you, and give more of your attention to the way you prefer things to be. With practice, you will change your point of attraction and will experience a substantial change in your life experience. Esther and Jerry Hicks, co-authors of The Law of Attraction Practice, and you will change your point of attraction. As I said earlier, there are many principles and practices regarding implementing a conscious approach to utilizing the Law of Attraction throughout this book. However, if you wish to explore the Law of Attraction more deeply, I recommend starting with these four books. There is a much more extensive list in the Suggested Reading and Additional Resources for Success section at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Jack Canfield's Key to Living the Law of Attraction by Jack Canfield and D.D. D. Watkins The Law of Attraction by Esther and Jerry Hicks The Secret by Rhonda Byrne Life Lessons for Mastering the Law of Attraction by Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, Gina Gabellini, and Ava Gregory And if you haven't seen the movie The Secret, I highly recommend you watch it. While its documentary format is far from that of a Hollywood blockbuster, it's the easiest way I know to get a quick and powerful overview of the Law of Attraction. Once you discover its power, you'll want to make the Law of Attraction a regular part of your life, a mindset you live with every day. Principle 7 Unleash the Power of Goal Setting If you want to be happy, Set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes. Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in America in the early 1900s. Once you know your life purpose, determine your vision, and clarify what your true needs and desires are, you have to convert them into specific, measurable goals and objectives, then act on them with the certainty that you will achieve them. Experts on the science of success... Know the brain is a goal-seeking organism. Whatever goal you want to give to your subconscious mind, it'll work night and day to achieve. The Awesome Power of Goal Setting For long as I can remember, trainers have cited a study on goal setting done at Yale, in which only 3% of the graduating class had written specific goals for their future. Twenty years later... Those 3% were found to be earning an astounding 10 times more than the group that had no clear goals. The trouble is, this study turns out to be merely an urban myth. As extensive reviews of available research literature by Dr. Gail Matthews and Dr. Stephen Krauss revealed that no such study had ever been done. Dr. Gail Matthews is a psychology professor at Dominican University, and Dr. Stephen Krauss is a social psychologist from Harvard University. However, as a result of this finding, Dr. Matthews decided to conduct a study of her own that focused on how goal achievement is influenced by writing down one's goals, committing to goal-directed actions, and being held accountable for those actions. A total of 267 participants, ranging in age from 23 to 72, were recruited from the United States, Europe, Australia, and Asia, and included a variety of entrepreneurs, educators, healthcare professionals, artists, attorneys, bankers, marketers, human services providers, managers, vice presidents, and directors of nonprofits. The participants were randomly assigned to one of five groups. Group one was simply asked to think deeply about their goals, what they wanted to accomplish over the next four weeks, but not to write them down. Groups 2, 3, 4, and 5 were asked to write down their goals. Group 3 was asked to also formulate a list of action commitments. Group 4 was asked to formulate a list of action commitments and then send their lists of goals and action commitments to a supportive friend. Group 5 was asked to do all of the above and provide a weekly progress report to a friend. At the end of four weeks... The participants were asked to rate their progress and degree to which they had accomplished their goals. The participants in Group 1 accomplished only 43% of their goals, 
while participants in Group 5 achieved 76% of their goals. That's a 33% increase over Group 1. The complete results are summarized here. Think about goals. Group 1, yes. Group 2 and 3, yes. Group 4, yes. Group 5, yes. Write down goals. Group 1, no. Group 2 and 3, yes. Group 4, yes. Group 5, yes. Share with a friend. Group 1, no. Group 2 and 3, no. Group 4, yes. Group 5, yes. Weekly progress report to a friend. Group 1, no. Group 2 and 3, no. Group 4, no. Group 5, yes. Success rate. Group 1, 43%. Group 2 to 3, 56%. Group 4, 64%. Group 5, 76%. This study provides empirical evidence for the importance and effectiveness of three essential success principles. 1. Write down your goals. 2. Make a public declaration of your goals. And 3. Being accountable to another person, such as a coach, an accountability partner, or a mastermind group, for the achievement of your goals. Also consider this. According to a study conducted by David Cole, Professor Emeritus at Virginia Tech, 80% of Americans report that they don't have goals. Some 16% say they do have goals, but they don't write them down. Less than 4% take the time to write down their goals, and less than 1% review them regularly. This small percentage of Americans who write down their goals and review them regularly earn nine times more over the course of their lifetimes than those who don't set goals. This study alone should motivate you to write down your goals. How much? By when? To make sure a goal unleashes the power of your subconscious mind, it must meet two criteria. How much? Some measurable quantity such as pages, pounds, dollars, square feet, or points. And by when? a specific time and date. It must be stated in a way that you and anybody else could measure it. I will lose 10 pounds is not as powerful as I will weigh 135 pounds by 5 p.m. on June 30th. The second is clearer, because anybody can show up at 5 o'clock on June 30th and look at the reading on your scale. It will either be 135 pounds or less or not. Be as specific as possible with all aspects of your goals. Include the make, model, color, year, and features, the size, weight, form, and any other details. Remember, vague goals produce vague results. A goal versus a good idea. When there are no criteria for measurement, it is simply something you want, a wish, a preference, a good idea. To engage your subconscious mind, a goal or objective has to be measurable. Here are a few examples to give you more clarity. Good idea. I would like to own a nice home on the ocean. Goal or objective. I will own a 4,000-square-foot house on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California, by noon, April 30th, 2017. Good idea. I want to lose weight. Goal or objective. I will weigh 185 pounds by 5 p.m. January 1st, 2017. Good idea. I need to treat my employees better. Goal or objective. I will acknowledge a minimum of six employees for their contribution to the department by 5 p.m. this Friday. Write it out in detail. One of the best ways to get clarity and specificity on your goals is to write them out in detail, as if you are writing specifications for a work order. Think of it as a request to God, Source, the Universal Mind, or the Quantum Field. Include every possible detail. If there is a certain house you want to own, write down its specifics in vivid, colorful detail, the location, landscaping, furniture, artwork, sound system, and floor plan. If a picture of the house is available, get a copy of it. If it's an ideal fantasy that doesn't yet exist in physical form, 
take the time to close your eyes and fill in all of the details. Then provide a date by which you expect to own it. When you write it all down, your subconscious mind will know what to work on. It will know which opportunities to hone in on to help you reach your goal. When you create your goals, be sure to write down some big ones that will stretch you and require you to grow to achieve them. It's a good thing to have some goals that make you feel a little uncomfortable. Why? Because the ultimate goal, in addition to achieving your material goals, is to become a master at life. And to do this, you will need to learn new skills, expand your vision of what's possible, build new relationships, and learn to overcome your fears, considerations, and roadblocks. Create a Breakthrough Goal In addition to turning every aspect of your vision into a measurable goal, and all the quarterly and weekly and daily goals that you routinely set, I also encourage you to set what I call a breakthrough goal that would represent a quantum leap for you and your career. Most goals represent incremental improvements in your life. They are like plays that gain you four yards in the game of football. But what if you could come out on the first play of the game and throw a 50-yard pass? That would be a quantum leap in your progress down the field. Just as there are plays in football that move you far up the field in one move, there are plays in life that will do the same thing. They include accomplishments such as losing 60 pounds, writing a book, appearing on Oprah, winning a gold medal at the Olympics, creating a killer website, getting your master's or doctoral degree, getting elected president of your union or professional association, or hosting your own radio show. The achievement of that one goal would change everything. Wouldn't that be a goal worth pursuing with passion? Wouldn't that be something to focus on a little each day until you achieve it? If you were an independent sales professional, for example, and knew you could get a better territory, a substantial bonus commission, and maybe even a promotion once you landed a certain number of customers, wouldn't you work day and night to achieve that goal? And if you were a stay-at-home mom whose entire lifestyle and finances would change if you earned an extra $1,000 or $2,000 a month through participating in a network marketing company, wouldn't you pursue every possible opportunity until you achieved that goal? That's what I mean by a breakthrough goal, something that changes your life, brings you new opportunities, gets you in front of the right people, and takes every activity, relationship, or group you're involved in to a higher level. What would a breakthrough goal be for you? Writing a best-selling book was a breakthrough goal for me and Mark Victor Hansen. Chicken Soup for the Soul took us from being known in a couple of narrow fields to being recognized internationally. It created greater demand for our audio programs, speeches, and seminars. The additional income it produced allowed us to improve our lifestyle, secure our retirement, hire more staff, take on more projects, and have a larger impact on the world. Reread your goals three times a day. Once you've written down all your goals, both large and small, the next step on your journey to success is to activate the creative powers of your subconscious mind by reviewing your list two or three times every day. Take time to read your list of goals. Read the list out loud with passion and enthusiasm if you are in an appropriate place, one goal at a time. Close your eyes and picture each goal as if it were already accomplished. Take a few more seconds to feel what you would feel if you had already accomplished each goal. Following this daily discipline of success will activate the power of your desire. It increases what psychologists refer to as structural tension in your brain. Your brain wants to close the gap between your current reality and the vision of your goal. By constantly repeating and visualizing your goal is already achieved, you will be increasing this structural tension. This will increase your motivation, stimulate your creativity, and heighten your awareness of resources that can help you achieve your goal. Make sure to review your goals at least twice a day, in the morning upon awakening, and again at night before going to bed. I write each of mine on a 3 by 5 index card. I keep the pack of cards next to my bed, and then I go through the cards one at a time in the morning and again at night. When I travel, I take them with me. Put a list of your goals in your daily planner or calendar system. 
You can also create a pop-up or screensaver on your computer, tablet, or smartphone that lists your goals. The objective is to constantly keep your goals in front of you. When Olympic decathlon gold medalist Bruce Jenner asked a room full of Olympic hopefuls if they had a list of written goals, everyone raised their hands. When he asked how many of them had that list with them right at the moment, only one person raised their hand. That person was Dan O'Brien. And it was Dan O'Brien who went on to win the gold medal in the decathlon in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Don't underestimate the power of setting goals and constantly reviewing them. Create a Goals Book Another powerful way to speed up the achievement of your goals is to create a goals book. Buy a three-ring binder, a scrapbook, or a journal. Then create a separate page for each of your goals. Write down the goal at the top of the page, and then illustrate it with pictures, words, and phrases that you cut out of magazines, catalogs, and travel brochures that depict your goal as already achieved. As new goals and desires emerge, simply add them to your list and your goals book. Review the pages of your goals book at least once every day. Carry your most important goal in your wallet. When I first started working for W. Clement Stone, he taught me to write my most important goal on the back of my business card and carry it in my wallet at all times. Every time I would open my wallet, I would be reminded of my most important goal. When I met Mark Victor Hansen, I discovered that he, too, used the same technique. After finishing the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, we wrote, I am so happy selling 1.5 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul by December 30th, 1994. We then signed each other's cards and carried them in our wallets. I still have mine in a frame behind my desk. Though our publisher laughed and told us we were crazy, we went on to sell 1.3 million copies of the book by our target date. Some might say, well, you missed your goal by 200,000 copies. Perhaps, but not by much. And that book went on to sell well over 10 million copies in 47 languages around the world. Believe me, I can live with that kind of failure. Write yourself a check. Around 1990, when Jim Carrey was a struggling young Canadian comic trying to make his way in Los Angeles, he drove his old Toyota up to Mulholland Drive. While sitting there looking at the city below and dreaming of his future, he wrote himself a check for $10 million, dated it Thanksgiving 1995, added the notation for acting services rendered, and carried it in his wallet from that day forth. The rest, as they say, is history. Carey's optimism and tenacity eventually paid off, and by 1995, after the huge box office success of Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber, his asking price had risen to $20 million per picture. When Carey's father died in 1994, he placed the $10 million check into his father's coffin as a tribute to the man who had both started and nurtured his dreams of being a star. One goal is not enough. If you are bored with life, if you don't get up every morning with a burning desire to do things, you don't have enough goals. Lou Holtz, the only coach in NCAA history to ever lead six different college teams to postseason bowl games, and the man who also won national championship and coach of the year honors, currently an ESPN commentator. Lou Holtz, the legendary football coach of Notre Dame, is also a legendary goal-setter. His belief in goal-setting comes from a lesson he learned in 1966 when he was only 28 years old and had just been hired as an assistant coach at the University of South Carolina. His wife, Beth, was eight months pregnant with their third child, and Lou had spent every dollar he had on a down payment on a house. One month later, the head coach who had hired Lou resigned, and Lou found himself without a job. In an attempt to lift his spirits, his wife gave him a book, The Magic of Thinking Big, by David Schwartz. The book said that you should write down all the goals you want to achieve in your life. Lou sat at the dining room table, turned his imagination loose, 
and before he knew it, he had listed 107 goals he wanted to achieve before he died. These goals covered every area of his life and included having dinner at the White House, appearing on The Tonight Show, meeting the Pope, coaching at Notre Dame, leading his team to a national championship, and shooting a hole-in-one in golf. So far, Lou has achieved 102 of those goals, including shooting a hole-in-one not once, but twice. Take the time to make a list of 101 goals you want to achieve in your life. Write them in vivid detail, noting where, when, how much, which model, what size, and so on. Put them on 3 by 5 cards, on a goals page, or in a goals book. Every time you achieve one of your goals, check it off and write victory next to it. I made a list of 109 major goals that I wanted to achieve before I died. I have already achieved 68 of them in only 24 years, including traveling to Africa, flying in a glider, learning to ski, attending the Summer Olympic Games, writing a children's book, and appearing in a movie. You can read my 101 goals list at www.jackcanfield.com forward slash 101 goals. Considerations, Fears, and Roadblocks It's important to understand that as soon as you set a goal, Three things are going to emerge that stop most people, but not you. If you know that these three things are simply part of the process, then you can treat them as what they are, just things to handle, rather than letting them stop you. These three obstacles to success are considerations, fears, and roadblocks. Think about it. As soon as you say you want to double your income next year, within moments considerations such as I'll have to work twice as hard, or I won't have time for my family, or my wife's going to kill me, begin to emerge. You might have thoughts such as, my territory is maxed out. I can't see how I could possibly get the buyers on my current route to buy any more product from me. If you say you're going to run a marathon, you might hear a voice in your head say, you could get hurt, or you'll have to get up two hours earlier every day. It might even suggest that you're too old to start running. These thoughts are called considerations. They are all the reasons why you shouldn't attempt the goal, all the reasons why it is impossible to achieve. But surfacing these considerations is a good thing. They have been there in your subconscious mind, stopping you all along. Now that you have brought them into your conscious awareness, you can deal with them, confront them, and move past them. Fears, on the other hand, are feelings. You may experience a fear of rejection, a fear of failure, or a fear of making a fool of yourself. You might be afraid of getting physically or emotionally hurt. You might be afraid that you will lose all the money you have already saved. These fears are not unusual. They are just part of the process. Knowing that in advance helps you move through them. Finally, you'll become aware of roadblocks. These are purely external circumstances, well beyond just thoughts and feelings in your head. A roadblock may be that nobody wants to join you on your project. A roadblock might be that you don't have all the money you need to move forward. Perhaps you need other investors. Roadblocks might be that your state or national government has rules or laws that prohibit what you want to do. Maybe you need to petition the government to change the rules. Stu Lichtman a business turnaround expert took over a well-known shoe company in Maine that was in such bad shape financially, it was virtually doomed to go out of business. The business owed millions of dollars to creditors and was short the $2 million needed to pay them. As part of the proposed turnaround, Stu negotiated the sale of an unused plant near the Canadian border that would bring the company $600,000. But the state of Maine had a lien on that plant that would have taken all of the proceeds. So Stu went to the governor of Maine to inform him of the company's dilemma. We can either go bankrupt, he said, in which case nearly 1,000 Maine residents will soon be out of work and on the unemployment rolls, costing the government millions of dollars. Or the company and the government could together pursue Stu's plan of keeping the company alive, helping to keep the state's economy growing keeping nearly 1,000 people employed, and turning the company around in preparation for a takeover by another company. 
But the only way to achieve that goal was to overcome, you guessed it, the roadblock of the state's lien on the plant. Instead of letting that lien stop him, Stu decided to talk to the person who could remove the roadblock. In the end, the governor decided to cancel the lien. Of course, you may not encounter roadblocks that require you to approach a governor. But then again, depending on how large your goal is, you very well might. Roadblocks are simply obstacles that the world throws at you. It rains when you're trying to put on an outdoor concert. Your wife doesn't want to move to Kentucky. You don't have the financial backing you need, and so on. Roadblocks are simply real-world circumstances that you need to deal with in order to move forward. They are just things that you will need to handle. Unfortunately, when these considerations, fears, and roadblocks come up, most people see them as a stop sign. They say, Now that I'm thinking that, feeling this, and finding out about that, I think I won't pursue this goal after all. But I'm telling you not to see considerations, fears, and roadblocks as stop signs, but rather as a normal part of the process that will always appear. When you remodel your kitchen, you resign yourself to a little dust and disturbance as part of the price you will have to pay. You simply learn to deal with it. The same is true of considerations, fears, and roadblocks. You just learn to deal with them. In fact, they're supposed to appear. If they don't, it means you haven't set a goal that's big enough to stretch you and grow you. It means there's no real potential for self-development. Learn to welcome considerations, fears, and roadblocks when they appear. Because many times they are the very things that have been holding you back in life. Once you can see these subconscious thoughts, feelings, and obstacles, once you are aware of them, you can face them, process them, and deal with them. When you do, you become better prepared for the next venture you want to undertake.